Well, the way that USC started 2016, it did not resemble Rose Bowl. Rather, Toilet Bowl. That was ugly and just smelt like a piece of shit. But after a rough September, the Trojans got it going, winning their last nine games, including doing a heck of a job against a high-scoring Colorado team and a great Washington team and coming from behind to beat Penn State in the granddaddy of them all. Which meant that the way USC season ended, it definitely smelled like a rose. <laughs> Trojans ended the year ranked number three in the country, and they are the overwhelming favorites to win the Pac-12 South. But can they win the Pac-12 in general and get to the college football playoff? Well, let's see. We'll begin offensively, where the Trojans, one of the biggest turning points last year, was benching Max Brown and going with Sam Darnold. Now, Darnold played the fourth game of the season, even though he didn't throw a touchdown pass in that game. And even though they lost the game, they only lost by four to a very game Utah team. And we saw potential that Darnold could be in for bigger things to come. And that's what happened, because the nine games after that, he never lost again. As a matter of fact, he threw 31 touchdown passes for the season, over 3,000 yards in the air, and 67% completion percentage. That tells you how accurate he is and also tells you, too, tells you how strong of an arm he has. And one thing that the stat sheet doesn't show about Darnold, his calm, his poise, his demeanor. He doesn't get too high, doesn't get too low. He's very businesslike, and he handled the big scene very well as a freshman. Now, entering a sophomore year, if he plays just as good, if not better, don't be surprised if this is the last year for Darnold. Even though it will be a sophomore year, he redshirted in 2015, so 2018. The NFL draft could be calling him, and he could be the first quarterback taken in next year's draft. So to not over-dramatize the following phrase, stay tuned. The ground game, well, it should be well-tuned because you have Ronald Jones II. He returns. You might remember he got off to a rough start, you know, in September. Justin Davis ended up getting uh, the bulk of the carries early on, but when, when Davis got hurt, Jones came back, and Jones played with the benches. In fact, the last five games of the season averaged – about eight yards per carry. USC's offense, let's face it, last year was very good. In fact, they were 20th in the country in total O. But they didn't really have lots of uh, big playability. At least they didn't show all the time. But entering this year, if you think there is at least one guy that could be that big play guy, it is Ronald Jones. Remember last year he had over 1,000 yards rushing, 12 touchdowns. And Stephen Carr could work his way in the starting rotation. He's just a true freshman. Now, receivers, and they've got two that are gone, Darius Rogers and Juju Smith-Schuster, who was a second-round draft pick. Both were dangerous outside threats, but they both had to be replaced, and it very well could be Michael Pittman and Jalen Green to handle that assignment. Now, as far as the inside receiver, the slot shouldn't be a problem. Deontay Burnett, whom a year ago was second on the team in touchdown receptions with seven. As far as the tight end goes, he really emerged uh, toward the latter part of the season. Daniel Imator Bebe, who enters this year as just being a sophomore, and ask Washington how good he is. And that upset win at Seattle, Imator Bebe constantly was killing the Huskies and had two touchdown receptions in that upset win over the eventual Pac-12 champions. Biggest question mark I have for USC, at least offensively, can they successfully replace three of their five starters who've now moved on, including both tackles, Chad Wheeler and Zach Banner, who was a mid-round pick by Indianapolis? And, by the way, the guy replaced one of the guards as well. Very big question because last year USC was great when it came to pass protection. Remember, this team played Alabama, they played Colorado, they played Washington, and played Penn State, and still only gave up 12 sacks. And they weren't playing against chip competition either. So this is going to be a major question mark. How will the new tackles do? Chuma Idoga now handles the pressure cooker position of left tackle. Other side, you got Chris Brown and at left guard, uh, Tom Lobodon. The two starters back, one at center, and he's a good one, and Nika Falal, and a guy that can play two at right guard, returning starter in Vianne Telemibal. So USC, pass protection. It was great last year. Can it be good again this year? It's going to be a major challenge considering – that three-fifths of the line had to be replaced. Of course, that nine-game winning streak by the Trojans to end 2016 
can also be credited to the defense and their fine play throughout much of that winning streak. The only exception would be against Penn State, in which, of course, the Nittany Lions almost had half 100 points in that game. Um, we're going to begin uh, talking about the defense with the line, and there's no doubt they're going to miss Big Stevie or Stevie T. Stevie Tua Kovalatu was a NFL draft pick just this past spring, seventh-round pick. He only played one year for the Trojans, a transfer from Utah, but at times commanded double teams. So his presence is going to be missed. Replacing him, perhaps, could be a freshman in Marlon Tupolatu, who decided to come to USC after originally committing to Washington. In fact, became an early enrollee um, for the Trojans, got to play in the spring game, and got valuable playing experience with the first-team defensive line. So there's no doubt expecting a lot from Marlon uh, Tupolatu. Also, on the defensive line, a guy that's proven himself as a Trojan, Rasheem Green, 55 stops a year ago, and led the Trojans with six sacks. Linebacker, they're very experienced in this area, and they could have one of the nation's best at linebacker. Cameron Smith, inside linebacker, not really known for getting to the quarterback, but definitely known for run stopping and for a linebacker, is very good at coverage, and a year ago led the Trojans in tackles with 83. Complimenting him on the outside will be both Porter Gustin, who had 13 tackles for loss, and a guy who got some valuable PT in 2016, Uchenna Wasu, at the other linebacking spot. So linebacking core, they're going to have one of the best in the country. Secondary will still have some experience, but they do miss at least two big-time gems. We're talking about the best defensive back in the country, Adoree Jackson, the Jim Thorpe Award winner at corner, and he was very valuable on special teams. So you got to replace him. Uh, looks like Jack Jones will probably be uh, the starter in this position. Jones last year saw some playing time as a freshman and saw a lot of playing time in the Rose Bowl after uh, Jackson could not finish the game because of injury. Imam Marshall will compliment him on the other side. And Marshall will be expected to be the leader in the secondary, had three picks a year ago. Safety, nothing but experience in this area for the Trojans. Uh, Marvell Tell, he's been there. And uh, Chris Hawkins, a senior, he's really been there. And when the Trojans decide to run 3-3-5, in other words, when they run nickel packages, expect to see uh, Jamel Cook in the lineup. The Trojans last year, third in the Pac-12 in defense. They had 367 yards per game. That's all they allowed, which, considering how high scoring of a league the Pac-12 is, I think that's pretty good. But quarterback pressure, again, um, is going to be very big. Uh, 26 sacks is all they had last year as opposed to 37, which they had two years ago. As far as special teams goes, Adoree Jackson, his um, his presence, to say it will be missed, well, no crap. It's going to be big time missed. He returned uh, four for touchdowns last year, two punts and two kicks. Now let's break down the schedule for the Trojans. And on one hand, when you look at it, I don't know if they're going to be an underdog in any of these games, even the Stanford game at the beginning of the season. Game number two, it's at the Coliseum. You might remember Stanford had their way with USC um, a year ago, winning by 17 points. And this might be the best defense, Stanford, that USC will face all year long. The next week, USC better be ready because Texas will have a very good offense, but the game is at the Coliseum. First time these two teams have met since Vince Young broke USC's heart in the uh, 2005 Rose Bowl to win Texas the national championship. And the rest of the schedule, do I see some trouble spots? Yeah, the Washington State game being played on a Friday night, uh, late September. Washington State's offense is dangerous. Notre Dame will be a better team that game, of course, in the latter part of October. Got to play them at South Bend. And the rest of the schedule shouldn't be too much of a problem. UCLA, who I think is facing a pressure cooker year with Jim Moore, they play the matchup at the Coliseum this year. Um, one part about this schedule, though, um, that might be the most troublesome isn't an opponent, but rather the timing. The Trojans don't get a bye week. They play 12 straight games with no rest at all, no extra week at all. In fact, their bye week will not occur until after the UCLA game, assuming that SC wins the Pac-12 South. Vegas has USC's win total pretty high has it at 10, and I'm going to agree with them. I think USC wins the South. I think it will be a nice year for Sam Darnold. And I do think the secondary and I think the linebackers are very good. But, again, how will USC do as far as stopping the run now that Big Stevie T is gone? And, of course, you've got to replace several members of that offensive line and your top two receivers. For those reasons, I can't pick USC to go to the college football playoff, 
But I will tell you this, they will win the South, and they will have a double-digit winning season. That's my look at the Trojans. Catch you later.